Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the regular season is kicked off, and as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to discuss the first couple games. Matt, I was excited after the first one. I turned around and said, the Flames are undefeated, and uh, that quickly went away in that second game. Yeah, well, at least for five of the periods, the team looked reasonably good. Um then the third period in the Pittsburgh game happened, but we'll get to that. <laughs> well, let's break these down. So uh, first game of the season, the home opener and the season opener, the Calgary Flames took on the Winnipeg Jets here at home in the Saddle Dome, and the Calgary Flames ended up winning 5-3 to three in that game. Uh, the Flames got goals from Mangiapane to open the scoring, Uyghur, Anderson, Lindholm, and then Mangiapane got his second of the year already. What were your thoughts on this one, Matt? I thought that the Flames played excellent defensively. Um, The Jets came to play, and like you could tell that the Flames were a little bit uncoordinated at times uh, with the new system, but the effort was still there. And like especially in the third period, uh, when they were up three to two for like the first fifteen minutes, they were playing pretty mistake-free hockey. Um, Then the one mistake happened and led to the tying goal. But um, I felt that, like, even though, like, the Flames were getting heavily outshot, like, I think it was, like, 28 to 14 at one point, um, that the game didn't really feel like uh, Calgary was not in control of the game. Um, That they were just kind of letting Winnipeg do their thing without letting too, too many dangerous chances. And then, like, every time that Winnipeg actually managed to break through and score, the Flames turned it on and got a goal of their own to restore the lead and they just kept trading goals all evening until the empty netter. It was a good, I would say 60 minute effort for the flames, which we haven't seen in a while. Yeah. And the fact is that this team offensively, they do not have a ton of finishers. Uh, so them being able to play excellent defensively for most of the contest, um, was a good thing. And you know, like the, on the marks from, uh, the third goal that uh, Mark Scheifele scored when the puck goes to Markstrom instead of trying to pass it up in a situation where opposing players are coming in on our guys he should learn to just put it behind the net and let the defenseman go get it because there have been a number of games last year and in the early part of Markstrom's stay with the Flames where he'd pass it up a turnover would happen like that and it would either lead to a really good scoring chance or a goal against and instead just let your rely on your defenseman to actually get the job done instead of trying to force the play it which it was a minor mistake but you know that could have ended in disaster for the flames and thankfully with uh, that excellent passing play with huberto and manjapani on the game winner with like two minutes left helped to s- salvage the the win out of that but it could have went the other way we'll talk a little bit more about markstrom after we're done recapping the week but as soon as i saw him make the first save of the game i'm like all right the flames are doing good yes that was his mo so much last year was let that first shot it's like all right he got a shot he saved it who they can do this yes (laughs) Um, the thing, if you listen to Ryan Huska talking after the game, he did note that his team kept giving the puck back to Winnipeg. And I did notice that a little bit sloppy there, but the one thing I wanted to commend the Flames for was how many faceoffs they won. I think they were 69% of all five on five draws they won, including two that led directly to their second and fourth goals. And that's something that we've seen the Flames struggle with in the past sometimes, just controlling the puck for the, you know, right off the faceoffs. And I really think that helped give the Flames the control they needed and the time they needed to make some decisions. Well, even uh, another. I agree entirely, but another little minor detail that I saw in the third period that I've been wanting this team to do for a long time was when the Jets would get the puck in the zone, uh, the players would either chip the puck up the boards and out or just flip the puck up in the air and out just to relieve some of the pressure and get the Jets to reset. And it's not always good. Like, if you have the ability to pass it and make a play out of the zone, that's always better, but in the the instances that they didn't, they took the safe, responsible play of just getting the puck out and let Winnipeg come in back at them instead of, you know, trying to force plays which end up 
resulting in turnovers sometimes. And I, I thought that was a nice little change that's subtle defensively that I think helped them a lot to secure the win. I think so too. And it was nice to see the coach already willing to change up his lines, not just for the sake of doing it, but when it made sense. Like, you know, we saw Andrew Mangiapane start the night on the third line and got moved up to the first line by the end of the night because he was doing well. And I like when coaches are willing to say, yeah, okay, you know, someone's performing, let's give them more time. It wasn't necessarily anything against Dubé, but Mangiapane had a great night and he needed to be moved up the lineup. And I think so often you see new coaches who don't want to change things or are afraid to make you know, those kind of or adjustments. ruffle the veterans feathers or this or that or whatever. And like we saw in the second game, Sharon Govich, who I thought played rather well in the first game, getting shifted down to the fourth line just to utilize his abilities a little bit better in what was needed for that game. Yeah, that was interesting. Well, let's go to that game. Um, the Calgary Flames went on the road and they're starting a, a little bit of a road trip to start the season off here, went to Pittsburgh and Played for two pretty good periods, 40 pretty good minutes of hockey, and then the third period happened, and not so much. The Calgary Flames lost 5-2 to two, uh, to the Penguins here. They're, the Flames got Matthew Coronado's first-ever NHL goal in the uh, second period. That was assisted by Lindholm and Anderson, and the only other Flame to score was Jonathan Huberdeau. It really felt like the first 40 minutes... Even when the Flames got down, you know, or not, I mean, not on the scoreboard, but when they were down on the ice, when they weren't cycling the puck as well, they always seemed to find an answer. And that's something we didn't see as much last year, right? They'd make a couple mistakes and it would kind of snowball. And I was glad to see that. I was glad to see them cycling. I was glad to see them coming back. I was glad to see them working through that. And then the third period happened. Yeah. And it was one of those where, like the first goal, there was nothing Markstrom could have done. That was just an excellent veteran play by Brian Russ, banking it off of his pad and in from behind the net. When the second goal, like 20 seconds later, happened, this is one of those things where, like, I it's a pet peeve of mine that ever since the instant replay thing and coach's challenge has come into play, uh, where it burns your time out, like, this is a situation where the team needed to just take a breather for a second and collect themselves because giving up two quick goals in a minute, like just to reset, but the team just kept spiraling for the next eight, 10 minutes and ended up, you know, getting down four to one eventually. And it just, it's frustrating because they played well enough. Like in the second period, they need, Frankly, they needed to score more than one goal with how well they played in that period. And yeah, yeah a veteran team like Pittsburgh is going to capitalize if you give them anything. Yeah, and really, I don't think the scoreboard tells the story in those first couple periods. Like, you know, the Flames should have, like you said, scored more than one in the first two periods. I think it's a strong Pittsburgh team that has to be given credit for keeping them off the scoreboard except for Coronado. Yeah. And honestly, it, it when you're playing a team that has that many veteran star players, uh, you, you know that you're not going to push them over and that they're going to come back at you and you have to give a 60-minute effort. And if you give any of those guys even a, a millimeter, they are going to run with it. And like once that first goal happened, you know, it, it just seemed that like it just lit the penguins on fire and like okay let's go and calgary didn't have an answer and they were kind of caught dumbfounded frankly and that's the period where unlike what i was saying before where i thought that they were able to come back from adversity well there was two goals in the first minute like brian russ scored at 18 seconds in the third and then smith at 41 seconds in in that first minute, that looked like what we'd seen from the Flames so many times where they got down and they just stopped playing. And I thought, and it wasn't even for the whole third, I don't think. There was about seven minutes there at the beginning of the third where you could tell they were feeling sorry for themselves. I'd say right up until the the Jake Gensel goal. And after that, I thought they started to push back. Like, And that's something we don't see a lot is them coming back and pushing back. And I just think by that point, it was too little too late. Yeah, and games like this happen. And you're always just glad when it's an Eastern Conference opponent where you're not harming yourself when this happens. Get it out of the way early. Yeah. And 
you know, like offensively, you can see that the Flames are still learning the system. You know, like passes aren't quite crisp. There are, you know, lots of little turnovers that they don't normally do unless, you know, and it's just one of those things. And, you know, the, it's going to take the Flames probably a good month, month and a half to get everything down pat. It's just frustrating when, you know, like they are doing the right things to generate the offensive chances, but they're just not able to thread the needle yet. Yeah, and I am I have confidence that that will change. Oh, I agree. and Because you can see that there are too many good setups, at, you know, through the first two games where, you know, if the pass was like a few millimeters up or whatever, whatever, like those things will start to connect. It's just not quite there yet. So after those two games now, the Calgary Flames are... Uh, one and one, obviously, they have two points, which puts them at 500 hockey. They now sit third in the Pacific Division behind Vancouver, who has two wins, and Vegas, who's played three games and has three wins. So uh, Vegas has six points, Vancouver has four, Calgary has two, and then LA, San Jose, Seattle all have one right behind us. Um, let's take a moment here to remind ourselves the Oilers have yet to win. Um, uh, and yeah, the- and they looked very bad against Vancouver in the first game, and then they couldn't score on the goalie in the second game. And bravo! Well, they they couldn't score on the goalie in either game. I mean, it was eight one the first game. Oh, I know, but they had a lot of shots in the second one. So yeah, which bravo. <laughs> so let's take a moment to remember that the Oilers haven't won before we move on. Yes. Congratulations, Edmonton. Keep you should awesome. feel proud of your start. Yes. Well, you know, they, um, they spent all offseason preaching how they needed to get better defensively and cut down the chances against, and then they their training regimen hurt their only good defensive defenseman, and, yeah, 12 goals in two games. So, yep, uh, good defense. <laughs> Matt, last week, you, when we were doing our season predictions, were a little bit critical of what you thought Markstrom might be this year or the form they might have and if he'd bounce back. I think after that first game, a lot of people thought, you know what, Markstrom's back. He's looking good. Obviously, it's one game. There's still, you know, 80 for the Flames to play at this point. But based on the two you're seeing, you know, we joked earlier about, hey, he saved the first shot in both games. What do you think of Jacob Markstrom we're seeing so far? Well, this is more like what Markstrom normally is. Where, which is a high-quality goaltender. And there's never been anything specifically against Markstrom. It was just that when you're seeing him play and struggle so mightily last year and, like, having zero confidence and letting in goals that, frankly, any NHL goaltender should stop and it happening every single start, and then you come into the preseason and every single appearance he did the same thing, you're going, is this just who he is now? And is he like basically a year away from not really being an NHL goaltender? Or is the actual real Jacob Markstrom going to come back? Through the two games, the real Markstrom has shown it itself. Uh, in the Pittsburgh game, I did not really think he had a chance on any of the four goals he gave up. Uh, the, just, you know, either really good plays by the Penguins players or just bad defense yeah i don't think we can fault them for any of those i mean they're a good team they're good shots it's not like marsham losses focus there yeah and even in the winnipeg game like none of the shots like the kyle connor goal seemed a little bit uh weak from the you know casual observer because it kind of bounced and squeaked in but that was a very perfectly placed shot by kyle connor and he's pretty much one of like five guys in the nhl who can do that to get it to bank in the way it did. And that was more a perfectly placed shot to get it to chip off of his elbow. Because if it had gone a little bit to the left, a little bit up, or a little bit down, Markstrom stops that. It had to hit specifically in the right spot, and it did. And that's just more of a, oh, you got beat by one of the elite goal scorers. Not, not. <laughs> I mean, no goalie's gone 82 games with a shutout, right? Everyone's going to get beat. But yeah. to me, it's always about how do you bounce back from it? And I think so far, and I want to be very cautious here. I mean, it's two games. And even after the first game, I heard people say, oh, Markstrom's back to form. It was one game. He didn't look terrible in every game last year either. 
But I think from what we've seen, he looks like he has the mental composure. Like even when he did get beat, he didn't let it happen again the same way. Um, yeah, and, and it's one of those where, like last year, if he gave up, made a mistake, he'd soon make another mistake, and usually it'd be like two nothing in short order. And then by that time, like he would compose himself, but it's already like you're way behind the black ball at that point, and hard to spring back from being down to nothing exactly and we've talked a lot about Mika Kipper stuff since his jersey's getting retired this year but it almost reminds me the Jacob Markstrom we've seen of Kipper where he'd get shot on mask goes up water goes in mask goes down he's ready to go again right like Kipper was very methodical when he got beat of okay I'm gonna you know process it let it go and move on and it felt like maybe Jacob Markstrom last year dwelled on his shots a little bit too much or things like that. So yeah. And it it really comes down to just simple confidence. And like last year, it seemed that like things just went wrong and then he could, he tried hard and he couldn't get it to turn around, which sapped even more of his confidence. And then more things would go wrong. And then he got replaced as the starter. And then he got back in and things kind of went okay ish. And then, you know, it was just up and down the rest of the way. And this year, it, the confidence level seems high. And he, like it, last year, uh, at one point, I had made mention that he was being too far in his crease, like too tentative. And like this year, you're seeing him properly challenging players instead of, you know, being too far in or, you know, he's doing things positionally in the correct way. Yep. He is. And, you know, I think, again, we're too early in the season to say he's back. You just mentioned that confidence. And I think we really need to see Jacob Markstrom get some adversity before we really know what we have there. It's game two. Wait until we get into the drudges of the season around January. And how is he doing after, you know, 20, 30 starts? Or wait until this team goes on a a six-game losing streak and how is he looking? Like, it's promising so far, but I I think it's too early for us to know what version of Jacob Markstrom we're going to have. Oh, I agree. And, but, you know, all things at this point are positive, and you just have to carry that into the next game and hope those things remain positive and wait and see. A good step forward for sure. Yeah. There's a, there's a topic I wanted to talk to you about last week, and we ran out of time because of our season predictions episode. If anyone didn't listen to last week, go back and take a listen to that episode. We did uh, some predictions for what we think might happen this season. We'll re- check back on them in January and again at the end of the season. Uh, those are available on firesidechat.ca, wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, Matt and I are notoriously terribly wrong and uh, horrible at this game, but it's fun to do. So well, go and listen you, to us. And sometimes we're, we're about 50 50, and then like a year like last year happens where it's like, oh, we got two right. Yay, good. <laughs> but Matt, the question I wanted to go through with you does do you think, let, let me put this in two parts. Do you think that the Calgary Flames are a little bit of an underdog this year? Oh, for sure. Because you look at them, there's nothing remarkable that they did to improve after last season. Like, Switching out to Foley for Sharon Govich is not going to light anybody's world on fire. And, you know, like, yes, Coronado's in the NHL, but he's only a rookie. And realistically, there's only so, like, even if he has, like, a Calder candidate season, there's only so much that that one player can do. And so, like, if you're an outside observer, you're thinking, eh, this team's kind of so so. But. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those where if the the players are playing to their potential, this team has an ability to surprise a lot. And we saw, like, in the Pittsburgh game where the they got the forecheck going and, like, this team is noticeably faster than last year's edition or years past. And it'll be interesting to see if they, you know, and the acquisition of Greer helped that I think quite a lot and Sharon Govich to you know just have players being able to get in on the opposing defenseman a lot more so I'll agree with you I think that the Flames I mean if you look at a team traditionally that is built for the playoffs which I think we can agree the Flames were last year the disappoints like that you would see wholesale moves like that team would say this isn't working we got to move it the Flames didn't and I think coming in with like you said almost the same roster minus to Foley I think a lot of people are underestimating what they can do. So Matt, my second question here, and I'll give you my thoughts first this time. 
does being an underdog or going in an underdog help or hurt the Flames this year? And my thought on this, I think that when we've seen the Flames have a season where there's big expectations, remember when they were first in the West and they got beat by Colorado pretty handedly in the playoffs, when they've gone in as top teams, they've been expected to go far, they always disappoint. And I think that going in this year with a little bit of that underdog mentality, a little bit of maybe flying under the radar, maybe being underestimated by other teams or other players, I think that could be one of the Flames' benefits this year is going into this season as the underdog, not having the expectations, not having to prove really anything to anybody, um, but just going in there and proving to themselves that they can do it first and they can get back to where they need to be instead of trying to you know, match last year's numbers or something like that. I actually think that might be one of the keys for the Flames here is that they will have the chance to prove people wrong and not be, you know, not, oh, the the first month is over and they're, you know, four and two. Oh, they're disappointing. I think that there's really no expectations there and, and that could help them. Oh, for sure. And... You look at like a number of players who had disappointing seasons last year, like Mangiapane, like Huberto, like Lindholm, like Kadri, where you know they were was more just generally expected of them, and for whatever reason things did not materialize. Each of those guys has a lot of pride in their own abilities, and are going to be pushing hard to say, "Hey, no, I'm not a crappy player. Thanks, I'm actually worth my good contract." thanks and let's go and you're starting to see a little bit more intensity from huberto and Kadri and lindholm and manjapani this year which it that that will boost the team and you know and i think one of the key factors that uh is very unheralded uh by most people is just how good the flames third and fourth line are uh, because of the fact that the Flames fourth line basically consists of uh, six foot three, six foot four, six foot five guys that are quick, and you have the backland Coleman and insert winger here, whether it's Dubay, Mangiapane, uh, Sharon Govich, like any of those guys, like th- those are two really good energy lines. And if you can properly manage it, where you're having those two lines being wrecking balls, that will free up more space for the top six to get going. And, you know, and you can see periods like what we did to Pittsburgh yesterday happen more frequently because you're going from guys like Richie, Lucic, and Lewis, who are not fleet of foot in any way, shape, or form, to guys like Dewar, Sharon Govich, uh, Greer, who are all very quick as players and they they're both all three of them are big enough and they they're physical enough where they're gonna cause havoc for the opposing defensemen and that's a big change and it's hard to have you know defend against like a line like that and then you're tired naturally because of that and then oh here's the huberto line to come after that and you know it's just the more difficult you can make the other team's lives, the better. Yeah. And going, you know, going back to that conversation of the underdogs are being underestimated. I think that there is a lot of depth to this team that other teams may not see. And that's what might be underestimated. And I think we've seen it in the past with this team where it's either the top, let's call it five players look really good and everybody looks terrible or the top five players look terrible and everybody else is picking up the scoring. Yeah. And I think, and you said earlier, this team doesn't have a lot of big finishers. I think that this year in order to be successful, they're going to need to be a committee and everyone's going to need to be working hard. And I think one of the things that might be underestimated, like you said, is some of the depth scoring. I think other teams might be surprised that, you know, they're putting, maybe they're not so good defensemen out against, you know, a Coleman or a Walker Backlund or Sharon G- Govich or Walker Dewar and the Flames are still able to muster if not goals shots on the net which we know that any shot can lead to a goal and I think it's I think that there's going to be teams that aren't expecting that I also think that in a Canadian market and obviously you and I've never played in the NHL but I think it's hard in a Canadian market when you know you are coming out and you are not meeting expectations and everywhere you go there's disappointment there's people talking about on the radio on TV on podcasts like ours Um, people the grocery store talking about your neighbors talking about it And I think that being out underdogs might just help these guys this year with that whole idea of, you know what, we got nothing to prove. Let's just go out there and play our game. 
Oh, for sure. And you know, I mean, if the Flames don't have a winning October, is it disappointing? Sure. Does it necessarily mean they're done? No, but I can see the media making it out that way. Oh, for sure. And I think that the important thing is is that this team is out on the road for an extended bit right off the hop, just so that way they can focus on hockey alone for the first few weeks and kind of get through all of the normal BS of that kind of thing. Five-game road trip. Yeah. Yep. Just, uh, you know, focus on the games at hand and go for it. It is kind of weird that they started here and then went on the road right away. Yeah. Go out east. You know, see you later. Come back in a couple Well, and you would think if they're going to do that, just start the season out there. But it's kind of weird. We start in Calgary, then go out east, then come back. Yeah. But, hey, you and I don't do the schedules, right? Well, hey, you know, you might as well get those out-of-conference games done early, and that way you don't have to deal with it later. Or you're, yeah, either you don't have to deal with it later, or it's a way to rack up some free points in a way early um, to to get that you know bit of an edge on your on your uh, conference and and divisional opponents. Yeah. I think that you know guys like Huberto as well. If I think if he were to have come in last year and been a point per game guy or been even a seventy point guy again, that's going to be hey, we expect you to do that again this year. We expect you to be that point per game guy. We expect you to, you know, put up those numbers and having a disappointing season, not just for him, but really everybody. I can't think of a flame that didn't have a disappointing season last year. I think that just not having some of those expectations when these guys do do well, I think both fans, media, pundits, and opponents are going to maybe give more praise to this team. And I don't want to, I don't want to compare them to the 04 team. Cause I think we can all agree as fun as that was, that was an anomaly. But I think one of the benefits of that 04 team was they had no expectations, right? I mean, they kept winning and winning and winning and everyone was okay if they lost any time because they shouldn't have been as far as they were. Yeah. And I think you might see some of that energy from the flames this year as well. Yeah. And then you look at like, uh, there's a whole bunch of players that have a lot to prove this year. And you know, like even the guys that are free agents to be like, you know, if you're looking at like a guy like Elias Lindholm, you know, he's wanting a fairly substantial amount of money. And, you know, like there's going to be motivation there to be excellent in order to get that paycheck that he's wanting. And same with Hannafin, same with, you know, Tanev and Zadorov. And, you know, like there are lots of Internal there's lots story. of desire to be better. Yeah, there's a lot of internal storylines to go along with. And even if you don't have a contract coming up, you just want to prove you're better than you were last year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And just to separate yourself from whatever the heck that was. <laughs> and, you know, okay, that was just a blip. And here, exactly. here's the real me. And <laughs> Well, just like we were talking about with Markstrom earlier, yeah. right? I mean, he had a bad year. Is this who he is or was this just a bad season? And... I think that that's going to be a real thing for the Flames. You have to bounce back and you have to prove to people we're not that. Yeah, exactly. And, well, how would you say Calgary uh, organizationally is kind of in this little bit of a middle zone where, like, frankly, a lot of their prospects are not either way too young or already kind of ready in the NHL, like Coronado and Peltier. And there's not really a ton of guys pushing up the rosters uh from the wranglers uh, other than wolf and maybe poirier uh in terms of like top six top four caliber guys and like this team regardless will need uh time uh, to accrue those type of players through the drafts upcoming and so they need the veteran guys here to actually be able to contribute like they should based on their career track records. And, you know, and I think even outside of this year, like, you know, kind of the underdog thing too, I think uh, we know the flames are going to be saddled with some bad contracts here. Like, I think we can all say right now, the cadre deal is not going to be a good deal in the last two years. So I think if you can come out being that underdog, you can do better than you should now, maybe get that cup or get to the Western Finals. I think a lot of those things can be forgiven if you see success early. Yeah, or even if they're still productive players uh, um, in years four, five, six, seven of those contracts where, like, even if you're, like the team struggles, you know, I, I'm using the Dallas Stars as a bit of an analogy here. 
where like they signed Ben and Sagan to those big deals and then the team kind of disappointed and fell apart a bit and yet those guys are still key contributors on that team even though they were able to reinvigorate their team with a bunch of young guys from the drafts after being able to you know kind of retool on the fly and whether this team ends up going in a situation like that or are just continually decent uh throughout either way you know it's good to have high quality veteran players and i think that frankly this team has needed some high quality veteran players over the last decade really like ever since aginla and his whole crew eventually started filtering out like we didn't really get any high quality veteran guys to replace them it was just the guys like Gaudreau, monahan kachuk which are necessary but how would you say it? it goes back to the ups and downs of when uh the flames would lose to colorado it, they wouldn't bounce back properly where having good quality veterans helps to mitigate some of that as well and you know it'll be interesting to see how this team can shift the balance from the veterans to the younger players while maintaining a competitive balance at the same time yeah, and we we always see teams that are competitive trying to balance that veteran young player lineup. So we'll see how the Flames do it this year. Well, and especially you look at like Coronado and he's looking like he's going to be a future high quality top six forward for this team. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they utilize him in a coordination with the veteran guys to maximize his abilities as well team I think has done this really well in the last couple of years is New Jersey. Yes, I agree. And I think maybe there's something to be learned from what the Devils are doing. Yeah. Um, well, let's move off that topic then. Let's kind of get through the rest of what we have this week. Some odds and ends and some listener feedback. You mentioned earlier that A.J. Greer got claimed off waivers. So for fans that don't know A.J. Greer, uh, he was claimed just before the season started. He's a left winger, six foot three. Uh, just over six feet, 209 pounds. He is he has played for Colorado, New Jersey, and Boston. His most productive season so far at the NHL level was uh, last year with Boston, 12 points. But he's no slouch either. I mean, one year he got uh, 32 points with the with the Eagles in uh, the AHL, 44 points with the Eagles, 52 points with Utica in 2021. Like this is not just because on the fourth line, simply a a grinder guy. This is a guy who's got some game to him. So before we talk about Greer, let's just talk about the move. We heard Craig Conroy talk going into the season that they wanted to make young guys spots on the roster that they could take. And you and I talked last week, should this be Klapka? Should this be somebody else? Who should fill that last role? How do you feel about the fact that the Flames said, you know what, we don't have the right guy in house. We're going to go out and bring in a 26 year old free agent to fill that role. Well, and uh, during our last episode, like I mentioned specifically that the Flames should keep Klapka because of his physicality. And, like, that was one thing that was readily apparent that this team needed on the fourth line was just a physical presence down there. And I think Klapka's close, but Greer is significantly better at just being a vet NHL veteran. And it's not like Greer is old. He's 26, and this is a player that... This will be his seventh season in the NHL. Yeah, like, this is a player that you could conceivably have for four or five seasons down on your fourth line playing effective minutes because he's a solidly built physical player who is smart defensively and and while you said they could have him for four or five years just to clarify he's a seven hundred and sixty two thousand dollar contract just over league minimum and he is a ufa at the end of the year but i could definitely see him coming back but as of now it's a low risk yeah acquisition and it's one of those where the Flames didn't intend on uh, that spot being open, um, the fourth line left wing. Realistically, Jacob Peltier should have been playing on the third line left I wing, guess. and whomever is on the third line should have been on the fourth line. But he got hurt. He's out for months. You need somebody that's a quality NHL player. Klapka could have done it, 
and been okay, but he would have also made rookie mistakes. And with this team trying to be successful and be a winning team, you need this slightly more veteran guy. It's not like Greer's old. He's 26. Like, he's a young player himself. But, you know, he's been around the league. He knows what he's doing. He played on the best team in NHL history last year and knows how to play defense. You know, like, they would not have had him in the lineup had he been bad defensively. So it's one of those where... You know, he's, and it, through the two games, he's been really effective on the four check. He screened the Uyghur goal, uh, Hella Buck, really effectively in the first game. And, you know, we'll see. Uh, but uh, for me, I, I think that he's one of the better fourth line players that we've had in recent history. And I'm very glad that the Flames were able to get him off of waivers. Yeah, me too. And, you know, I think that Conroy did this the right way. If this was previous years i mean we saw that they would fill up that spot in training camp or with ptos i mean you know toby reader comes to mind and all these other guys that we'd bring in to fill that spot before we even left it open for a young guy to take those spots were already spoken for and i think this was done right like you said they left the spot open nobody took it and we could argue if someone should have or not but that's a different discussion no one's there like you said i think that was peltier spots so yeah or even kevin rooney had he not been hurt he probably would have got that spot but exactly. Or a... should we have promoted Klapka? But the organization felt he was better in the HL. So they gave everyone a chance and then said, we know what we have. We know what we don't. Let's go out and find that piece. And at the price of AJ Greer, I have no problem. I think it's a great fourth liner. I don't like the idea of just putting a bunch of young guys near fourth line. Because like you said, they all make mistakes. You know, rookies, I think if you want them to develop more, need more time to play. AJ Greer is... Let's be honest, he's a fourth-line NHLer. There's a guy who, being in this spot, I think, is his job. And he knows how to do that job. And he knows how to play with, you know, eight, nine minutes a night and still be effective. I mean, last last year he got 12 points and 114 penalty minutes. Like, this is a guy who, that's, you know, what we want from a guy like that. And I think it. you and I talked about how uh, Dennis Gilbert could be the Flames' tough guy. I think A.J. Greer is definitely going to be that guy to muck it up as well now. And I think he's fitting in really well. I really like this move. Yeah, and he's just a gritty, good, responsible player. And, like, we saw, like, when the Flames were really cycling hard against the Penguins yesterday, that a lot of the times it was Greer pushing around the Penguins' defenseman. And, you know, he was noticeable in that second period for the right reasons of just getting in on people. And... That that fourth line was noticeable on a number of occasions, just because of the fact that like they were relentlessly forechecking that the Penguins' defense, and you know that's their job, and he did an effective job, and that's perfect. You know, like that's exactly what you need. Yeah, and still a young player too. I mean, this isn't like Brad Richardson. We brought him in when he was like thirty-five or thirty-six. 26 is still a guy who's, you know, a young player who's in their prime. And I like that, that the Flames are, you know, still bringing in a young player to what Conroy said. They're not bringing in, you know, a a veteran or, you know, even a a tweener guy. I mean, this isn't really a a Richie. This isn't, you know, I guess either Richie that we brought in. Like, I think A.J. Greer, we can all agree, is probably an NHLer. Yeah, he's played some in the AHL, but I think he has the skills to be a a full-time NHLer. I agree, and it's one of those where, you know, you make decisions later on in the season when guys like Pelte and Rooney are back and healthy, but, you know, for the time being, however many months that'll be, you know, you have a very high-quality fourth-line forward, and, you know, whether he stays And you and I talked last week about who should be number 13, right? And right now it's Dryden Hunt. I could even see Hunt being sent down when somebody comes available and Greer being that number 13. I think that's a great spot for him too. Mm -hmm. Because again, a guy who's not going to develop a lot more, and that's what I want in my number 13. Not a guy who's going to be stunted development-wise if he's not playing every day. I think we know what we have in A.J. Greer. We know what that player is. He's not going to get a ton better by not playing daily. The HL is not going to do him any favors for his development, and that, to me, is kind of the perfect guy to be your number 13. Yeah, he's definitely your prototypical plug-and-play guy. Yep. 
And at the cost, I mean, the Flames looked for somebody cheap. I think it's a great deal. And I'm not saying Greer, when I say he should be an NHLer, that he'll be here all day, um, or sorry, all year. I think there will be a day you'll see him sent to the Wranglers this year, even if just for, you know, one day to try somebody else up or for some, some cap relief or we need to switch this money for that money. I think he will get waived at some point. But I think that at the end of the year, you'll see him play more games with the Flames and the Wranglers. Yeah, I, I'm until he plays his way out of a spot, I think he will stay in the lineup. And like, how would you say? I'd almost expect somebody else to lose their spot over him. I was about to say that too. Yeah, Greer's doing what Greer needs to do in the role Greer's given. Yeah. Like I, I could I see could him, al- like I said, putting him down, you know, to try some out. Or if he gets hurt, I mean, playing that way, you probably will get hurt at some point. Yeah, and it's one of those, like, you could see, like, a guy like Rashitska just to pick on him for no reason. Um, him sliding into the press box for a few games here and there as well, where, you know, you're less likely to see uh, Greer's play vary too much uh, yeah. as the season goes on. So we'll see. But Yeah, you know, and I mean, I, I still don't know where we're at with Walker Dewar. I mean, maybe that's a guy that, you know, loses a spot at some point for, you know, a week or two. But, yeah, I think you're right. I and mean, there's other guys we would see before Greer. But I don't I, – I just – I don't know. I don't see Greer being here all year just because of some of those injuries you mentioned. Yeah. It'll be an, a good problem to have of, oh, we have too many good players, and let's see. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? I mean, maybe you need a couple guys to uh, you know to, to protect your, your little guy when Peltier comes back, and maybe that's where Klapka gets brought up, and it becomes Klapka, Greer, Peltier. And, you know, there's, there's lots of options there, and that's a good place to be. Yes, exactly. And versatility is definitely necessary with this team. And I've liked that the Flames have used uh, both Dubé and Sharon Govich on the wing and center to start this year. They're definitely exploring their options there and seeing what they've got and who can do what. And I think the more we know who can do what, when injuries start to happen, the better prepared we're going to be. Yeah. And, you know, just as an aside, I always like when the Flames or any team uh, picks off decent quality players from good teams. Like guys like Sharon Govich and like Greer, where you know, like they're not important pieces on either the Bruins or Devils, but they're good players, and yeah. you know, like they they have cap troubles too, and or roster spots. Like Boston had another good young player come up and take Greer's spot. They weren't expecting to get rid of Greer, and it just the other guy played better and showed more potential so it made sense for them to let go of Greer which a lot of Bruins fans were disappointed (laughs) but you know Calgary at least um is the beneficiary of getting some of those depth players from the good teams which helps make your R team better in the interim exactly yeah so I I think it's a good it's a good move and we'll see what happens with it long term um but let's move off the ice before we get to some listener feedback here Matt, I didn't think the day would come. The new arena looks like it's finally moving forward. Well, when they actually, you know, put shovels in the ground, then I will believe it. <laughs> we you we know. don't even know what the thing is going to look like. We're told there's going to be an arena on this plot of land someday by 2027. It's like, cool. A, renderings. B, shovels. Then, you yeah. know, then we... T- you know because it, it, we've been down this road what four or five times now like calgary next all the way since calgary next yeah and it's just like oh and this arena fell through and this one and that one and this one let's just say they're further along from what i've seen in city council minutes and stuff than they have been before so i'm pretty confident it's going to move forward yeah. but there's not a lot to talk about we don't even know what the building is going to look like i mean we know some of the features of it we know there'll be a you know a practice rank a 1000 seat uh, you know, venue that can be used by other teams, that sort of thing. But we we can't get excited and we don't even know what we're playing in. Is it going to be dome-shaped, square-shaped? Is it a big Amazon box? Like, what is it we're playing in? Yeah, we'll see. So just wanted to, to point out that it sounds good. And 2027, I mean, that's when they're expecting this thing to be done, 2026, 2027. And I think, you know, based on where what we were talking about earlier, and I think you've already gone down that road a number of times this episode and other episodes but the flames are at a turning point and i think this might be 
even more of a reason for them to make sure they're being a good playoff team because they want to make sure when they get in that new building, they have a good team to start paying off the bills of building that and not be in a, you know, 10 year rebuild where they're not going to get that playoff dollars. So I could see that being a little bit of a motivator for the brass of, okay, we got to stay competitive and find ways to stay competitive to get in that new building, to get that playoff money. Yeah. And you look at like organizationally, like this team in effect was able to trade to Foley and his roster spot for Coronado to play in his place and get a high quality third line player in Sharon Govich. And it's one of those things where like, as this team gets older and matures and you have more prospects, you're going to end up likely seeing some trades like that to swap out some veteran players to get some more youth in while you have some young players that should be filtering up. But they're going to have to make sure that that youth is being balanced, I think, and yes. making sure that they're moving. Even if they're not doing it now, they've got to make sure that for 2020, I think if I was the owner, I'd be saying for 2026, 2027, 2028, we got to make sure that we're competitive. We're bringing that youth in, but we have a sustainable group here that can keep bringing us that playoff revenue. Yeah, and be a high-quality team as well, like not just uh, in and out in the playoffs. Like No, but that's what I mean, a sustainable group yeah. that you know you can you know get three or four runs out of. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go to some listener feedback then. I think that's all for the Flames uh, until our predictions. Unless there's anything else you want to talk about before we go there? No, I think we should move on and get on with all the fun. Ian Ian Perkins left a message on our website. If you ever want to get a hold of us, you can always do that on our social media, uh, on Twitter or X. We're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're uh, Fireside Chat. We're on YouTube. You can find us everywhere. If you go to our website at firesidechat.ca, you'll see all our social media links right at the top. Or you can do like Ian did and leave a website right or leave a comment right on the Fireside Chat website. And he just clicked on last week's uh, show and then left a comment there. And we were happy to answer that. So Ian Matt was asking about, uh, will you speak to the fact that Phillips made the Washington team? Still a little miffed the Flames let him walk. I'll take this one first and then I'll get your thoughts on that if that's okay. Definitely. I think that Matthew Phillips, I mean, yes, and and we can't change the past at this point. You know, we could sit here and say, you know what, maybe Phillips shouldn't have been treated the way he was, but based on what happened, I can't blame Phillips for leaving. I don't know Matthew Phillips would have got much more than a third line spot in Calgary. And with a new GM coming in, a new coach, he probably didn't even know if he'd get that. So I think it makes sense for him to move somewhere where he's probably knows. I mean, let's be honest, the Capitals are on a bit of a downswing. I think if you're a young player looking for a roster spot, you want to move to a team that needs young players that you know is going to give you that shot. He's only on a one-year deal. It doesn't mean he'll never be a flame again. I'm a little bit miffed too, but I also don't know that this is going to be a player that his fans were going to miss on ice performance for. Like he's a nice guy. He's a hometown guy. I think he's a third line guy. I don't think we're going to look back and go, Oh wow. You know, they put him with Ovechkin and I know they did that a little bit during the preseason and he lit it up and got 35 points. I think there's just another, and I, I don't mean this to be derogatory towards Phillips anyway, but I think there's just another depth piece that we liked because of the hometown boy. Yeah. And it, you know, like it's always frustrating when you lose, young players like a lot of people were disappointed last year when the flames lost valimaki on waivers and this year with losing phillips Mm -hmm. and realistically like would valimaki be a top piece on the flames defense no no like he'd be our number six and 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 by that i think phillips and greer would hold down the same roster spot yeah and realistically i would rather have the big physical greer than the shifty Phillips frankly just because like as bad as it sounds like we already have Dubé and Manjapane who are not the tallest of players and like there are only Peltier yeah and Peltier where like you can have small players and be effective but you can't have a ton of small players and be effective and unless Phillips like turns into a good draw level player it's you know just not really feasible for the flames to have four guys that are undersized because you're at a significant disadvantage and you know and it's 
it sucks because you know we both on a personal level liked Phillips the few times that we spoke with him. And Wranglers fans who saw him love him. Yeah. I mean, he's a great, he's a good hockey player. But I think if you look at this roster, I mean, barring injury, if you look at the players that are here, take one of them out, let's say Greer and put Phillips in. Can you see a spot where Phillips plays higher than the third line regularly? No, not really. Like, Can you see that in Washington? I, I can. Yeah, Is there, it, well, and know, that's where like guys like Austin Zarnick in the past or Phillips, you know, like you go to a lesser team to try and yep. you know get a roster spot and well, i mean even sunny milano right got cut here last year and now he's a full-timer in washington yeah and like he was terrible here and it's like is this player an actual nhl player and yet he played perfectly well in washington but like he was not an nhl caliber guy on our team last year no. and you know like and a lot of people are disappointed with that too but it's like you know you have to also put up in order to get you know <laughs> results and yeah he didn't i think that i think that the move for phillips is the best thing he could do i mean again as flames fans it's sad to see him go but i think for two reasons one he's on a roster where he has room to move up he can be more than a third liner he can see prove what he can do and being a calgary boy nothing says that he doesn't come back to the flames and say this is what i am let's talk next year and i could totally see that happening in a year or two coming back here once he's developed i think like you were saying with young players once they're developed and we know what they are, if the Flames say that's what we want, I could see them putting him back on the roster. Secondly, he's also following his AHL coach. And I have to think that part of his success, probably a significant portion of it, was that coach. I think that's true of him. I think that's true of Wolf. I think that's true of a lot of guys in that team. And I think it's probably a great place for him to go because he's following that coach. It's sort of like we've talked a lot of times with Huska and some of the young players and Kale McLean and some of the young players and following them to the NHL level. And I, I think, you know, if we want to look at it as a person, I think it's the best thing we can ask for, for Matthew Phillips as a player. I agree. And I'm hoping for all the best for him. Like I would love to see him secure a full-time roster spot with the Capitals. He, has played well enough where he deserves to be in the NHL. It's just now up to him to like what degree of an NHLer and how long his career is. But you know, that's, you know, we have to see and, yep. you know, and congrats to him for making the Capitals opening night roster. For sure. If anyone's watching the Capitals game, he's number 45 there. And, you know, I, I, I don't think this is the kind of player who sticks around in one market for a while. I can see him jumping around from NHL market to NHL market, trying to find a full-time home. I mean, sort of like Greer did, right? And a lot of these, you know, lower guys are moving from market to market every year or two. I think he's I think he's got what it takes to be a full-time NHLer. Do I think he's going to be a top six full-time NHLer on a competitive team? No. But I think going to a team like Washington, we'll get to see him in a top six at some point and see if he can do it and see what that jump looks like. Yeah. But I think, you know, as Flames fans, and again, I don't want to sound like a knock, and excuse me if I do, I think maybe we overvalued him because he was the Calgary boy and we liked him. And, you know, that's great. But I think Matthew Phillips right now is in the best place for Matthew Phillips. I agree. You know, I think he probably would have been the 13th forward for the Flames or you know, in that AJ Greer spot, either would have been in the, uh, in the wa Dryden hunt spot or the AJ Greer spot. So I think he's exactly where he needs to be to see what he can do. And how often have we seen a guy who looked good in the HL that didn't translate to the NHL? Oh, I know. Not and you know, I would rather someone else figure out if he can do it than us. Yeah. Well, we're just not in the position right now. Well, that's about, well, that's why, you yeah. know, like, and I think because the flames are competitive, the first time he had a bit of a misstep, he'd either be taken out of the lineup or maybe sent to the HL. And I think going to Washington, you know, you're probably going to have a full-time job there this year. Yeah. Well, you look at like any of the basement teams and like Washington, frankly, is going to be a basement team this year. It, you know, you're growing for next season and the season beyond. And you're kind of auditioning for future roles uh, if you're under the age of 30. And, you know, it's one of those where Phillips is trying to earn a full-time roster spot in the NHL. And, you know, getting the leash and runway to be able to figure out what he is as a player is perfect in that situation. 
And even if, you know, let's say you're his agent and you call him on July 1st and the Flames did make an offer and you say you got two options. Come back to the Calgary Flames who maybe haven't shown you the love you wanted and hope they do and Connor is a nice guy and you know all that. Or go to a team where you're going to sit on a learning tree of Backstrom and Ovechkin and Kuznetsov. I think as a young player, there's a lot of, even if you're not playing with them night in, and night out, there's a lot of um, desire to sit under that learning tree and be part of that group. Yeah, and even just to learn tips and tricks that they do. That Watching make, how they do it, yeah. yeah. Because it's the little things. And like they mentioned... Yeah. And yes, I mean, already in the, post in the preseason, he's had a chance to play with Ovechkin. How many guys can say that, even in the preseason level? Yeah, and you look at, like, uh, they mentioned this on the broadcast yesterday, um, with uh, how... Um, Crosby and McDavid both struggled in the faceoff dot in the first years of their career and were terrible as center icemen and yet uh, in the faceoff dot. And yet now they're amongst the league leaders in that because they learned all the tips and tricks from the better players around the league. And, you know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, if you're able to be a sponge around those guys things will filter through and you know that's how you can actually take the next step is if you are around people that actually know how to go from a to b and teach it to you <laughs> yeah and and as young guys i think those are the guys you looked up to too and everybody wants the chance to play with their you know the guys they looked up to so Ian, hopefully we answered that. If there's anything more, or if we didn't touch on something you want to let us know, we're happy to re-explore the conversation or the topic. And again, if anyone else wants to put something out there, let us know through social media. Let us know on firesidechat.ca in a comment. Or if you go to firesidechat.ca and go to the con the contact section, send us an email and we'd be happy to discuss as well. I, I know that for both Matt and I, one of our favorite parts is hearing what you guys want to talk about and what you know is on the fans' mind. Prediction time, Matt? Yep. Everybody's favorite part of the show. So last week, uh, I got the right number of wins and losses with the wrong teams. I thought they would lose to Winnipeg, win to Pittsburgh. You being you were pessimistic, thought they'd lose both of them. So neither of us get the get the win there. I'm close. It's almost like a shootout win, but not quite. Um, this week, the Calgary Flames have three games. They continue this road swing that they're on. Tomorrow night, they play Matthew Phillips and the Capitals in Washington. That's a 5 p.m. Mountain start on Monday, so an early game. And then they have a couple days off. Then on Thursday, they'll play the Buffalo Sabres, again, a 5 p.m. Mountain start. And the following night, on Friday night, uh, the Calgary Flames will be in Columbus, taking on Johnny Goudreau and the Columbus Blue Jackets in Columbus, another 5 p.m. start. And then uh, a week from today is a 3 p.m. start. That's such a weird one. It's not quite a matinee game. It's not quite an evening game. The Calgary Flames are in Detroit, taking on the Detroit Red Wings. So, Matt, four games in the docket. What are you thinking? Um, I think they're going to go two and two. Which two do they win? Um, I'm going to go with the Washington and the Detroit games and lose the other two. Why is that? Uh, well, they played poorly against the Sabres last year. So I'm figuring that will continue. And it's hard to say you play poorly against team you only see twice. Yeah, and then they embarrass themselves twice against the Blue Jackets. So I'm figuring that will happen again. <laughs> and yeah, we'll see. Well, wasn't last year the Blue Jackets game? I look back at this. They embarrassed themselves. And then Daryl made some comment about the guys partying at Johnny's house or something. And we never really got full answers to that. Yeah. So I, I still don't know what happened there. But, yeah, he thinks that they maybe partied at Johnny's and they weren't ready to play. Or, I don't know, we never really got an answer to that. <sighs> this is a tough one for me because these are all teams I think are either on the upswing or the downswing. Like, in the Capitals are on the downswing. We should beat them. Buffalo, usually I look at as an easy win, but this is a team that's really improved. And as a Western Conference team, we don't see that. But I think they're going to be a... A surprise for a lot of people yeah, in the East like this year. Yeah, I think they'll be like between 7th and 10th this year in the East. And where that goes is just due to how good all the other teams are. Like There are so many good teams in the East. And I'm going to say that they... 
I think that they they're still gonna. I think after two days rest, they're gonna be able to beat Buffalo. I think they're gonna be ready for it. I think they're gonna feel good. I'm gonna say they beat Buffalo. They lose the back to back, which I think Dan Vladar will start in against. Uh, Johnny, I think if it was in Calgary, there'd be a lot more desire to make sure they didn't lose to Johnny and his team. But being in Columbus, I think that that one, they're going to be tired and I don't know if they'll be ready for. And then I think the Sunday at 3 p.m., we saw better success lately with matinee games. And even though it's not quite a matinee, I'm going to say that they're going to win that one. Okay. So I'll say they win Washington, Buffalo, and Detroit. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, weird games. Make sure that you're uh, maybe going into work this week early so you can get off early because these are all going to be early starts for the Flames. And then they've still got, um, after that, two home games at the Dome before they go on the road again. So kind of a weird month. Well, it's good that they're getting the road trip out of the way and like against all the Eastern teams because, frankly, um, with the team not uh, knowing the system down pat, uh, you know, like they're going to struggle at times through the first two months of the season because we see this pretty much every time any team gets a new coach. Um, but, you know, if you're losing points, it's always better to do it to the other conference. And so them playing mostly Eastern teams for the first stretch of games, that helps significantly in my books just because, although it sucks, you frankly care a little less if you lose. <laughs> I think there's two ways to look at it. There's that way, and then there's another way to look at it, which is let's put up the points against the Eastern team so later on when we start to lose to our division rivals, we've got the points yeah. sort of banked. I agree. But, it, it, you know, it's one of those where, yes, <laughs> but also reality of, you know, because they're not familiar with everything yet, you know, they might struggle out of the gate a bit. And I don't think they'll struggle as much as they would if it was an outside coach. Like, if they would have brought in Gallant or someone who didn't know these guys, didn't know the system, didn't know the players, then there'd be a lot more struggle. Maybe I'm underestimating this, but I think that because Huska was there, because Huska knew the language that was used last year, because Huska knows a lot of these guys, I'm expecting it to be a pretty easy transition. Mm -hmm. Matt, where do you play Dan Vladar this week, if at all? Uh, definitely the Columbus game. You don't want to play your starter back to back this early. No, and frankly, I think you give Markstrom a little bit of a runway with the first four games, um, with the Washington and Buffalo so games. You play in Washington, you play in Buffalo. Yeah, because there's been enough spacing between each of those games where it's not like he's going to be fatigued at all. Let him naturally get those four starts, see how he's doing. Let Vladar play, and then, you know, if Vladar shuts out the Blue Jackets, then you maybe give him the Detroit game. But you probably go back to Markstrom after that, just for... Yeah, I, I think that there's an argument to play Vladar twice in a row, both uh, Columbus and Detroit here. G see what he's got. See where he's at for the season. You need Markstrom to be ready for the 29th for the outdoor game, and there's a lot of time around that. I mean, they have two days on either side of that that he can, you know, be ready and work himself hard and then have a couple of days rest. But... When I look at this, I think Vladar definitely plays the Blue Jackets game. I think he, he might play the uh, Red Wings game. We'll talk more about these next week, but I think I would put him in at least one of the home games if he doesn't get the Red Wings game, either the yeah. Rangers or the Blues. Yeah, and I think that um, like there's a solid argument to have Vladar in the Red Wings game just due to it being the morning game, just so that way you're not throwing marks from schedule off as well. For sure, yeah, and, and I think, you know, if I'm just looking at it right now as an outsider, I think I would pencil Markstrom in for those two because we got to see, or, or sorry, I would pencil Vladar in instead of Markstrom for those two because I think we got to see what we've got in both goalies early, and we don't want to, you know, just go to Markstrom when, you know, Vladar's not looking good and we don't know where he's at. Oh, for so sure. So I think we got to get him some game action too. Yep. And you know what? I mean, I you know, this sounds terrible to Flames fan, but if you drop the two because you're checking out how Markstrom looks, you can afford that right now. Yeah. You know, you can't afford that maybe in a month. So, you know, why not take advantage of it? It's two, like you said, Eastern teams, the points aren't as important. I'd argue two maybe easier teams when you look at the schedule coming up. I think there's a lot of argument for that. Yep. Well, Matt, enjoy this uh, Eastern swing. Enjoy the early games, and we will talk to you next week. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. 
This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.